traditional Jewish folk tale, actually an adapted pagan version of one. Once upon a time, Ruby, the old witch, lay dying. And in the morning, her three apprentices came into her room and they took one look at Ruby and they said, what on earth is the matter? And Ruby said, I have had a dream and I know the question the great mother will ask me at the end of my life. Ruby, you have been an exemplary witch. What could she possibly ask you that would have you so frightened? I know that she will not ask me why weren't you more like Bridget, loyal and devoted. She will not ask me why weren't you more like Kuan Yin, faithful and strong. And she won't ask me why weren't you more like Venus, loving and kind. No, she will say, Ruby, why weren't you more like Ruby? And then what will I say? What could any of us say? To be that truly ourselves requires great courage and confidence, but more than anything, it requires that we take the time to know ourselves. A practice, not a destination. It requires that we regularly contemplate the age-old questions, who am I and why am I here? But these questions are often too abstract for us to get our head around. And that's where storytelling comes in. It's the superpower we have that grounds our reflections in our experiences and allows us to explore these questions and then share them. There's a mountain of evidence and research about the power of storytelling in its impact on the audience. We are persuaded, entertained, engaged, connected. And I want us to accept as a given those powers of storytelling. Because I want to explore storytelling from a different angle, from the angle of its impact on the person doing the telling. I want to show you that, our, that storytelling can support us to live more satisfying lives by enabling us to reflect upon and deepen the meaning of our experiences. But first, this word, storytelling, it's a pretty rubbery buzzword. It's a bit like creativity or innovation. It's got many different um, meanings. The storytelling I'm talking about has five core qualities. The first is that it's oral and told live before a live audience without notes. There's memoirists, filmmakers, audio storytellers, they all um, gain insight from their process. But as the emotions researcher, the professor of psychology, Barbara Friedrichsen, says, and I quote, true connection is physical and unfolds in real time. The second quality is that the story is true and personal to the teller. It's about their lived experience. The third quality is that the story holds meaning. It tells us about the internal journey as well as the external events experienced by the teller and within the story is embedded a comment about life. The fourth quality is that it's told in what I call performance time, which means that the teller is not interrupted, they have the floor. This allows the teller to relax into their story but also ensures the audience listens to understand, not to reply. The fifth quality is that the story is given as a gift. And this is what distinguishes it from therapy. Because it's given as a gift, the teller needs to ensure that the, the story is complete and finished. It's a satisfying whole. It's not something that's raw or confused or unprocessed. So the best way I know to demonstrate these qualities is to tell you a story. When I was 25, my sister came and asked me if I would speak at her 21st birthday. And I said, of course, I would be honoured. I had, in fact, been priming her for about 10 years. It was part of our mother's feminist legacy that we would have a voice and we would ask women to speak on our behalf when we had that opportunity. And I had visions of telling a brilliant speech. 
It would be heartfelt, people would laugh and cry, it would be full of stories, it would be moving. But right up until the day of the party, I couldn't think of anything more than a list of adjectives about my sister. So I'm helping prepare at my mum's house and I have to take myself off to do some more work on the speech. And I sit down with a piece of paper in her spare room and I, I write, Amanda's wonderful, I love Amanda, she's a great sister, nothing else. So I immediately think my sister has lived an incredibly dull life. But the reality was I didn't come from a storytelling family. I came from a political family. We would argue till we were blue in the face about a policy, but we didn't tell stories. So in that moment, I decide I'm gonna win it. I've done debating at school, I'm studying law. I've been told I'm quick on my feet. It will just emerge fully formed when it needs to. Not only that, this is a righteous cause. I have womankind to support me. And I have love on my side. So with that settled, I go back to helping prepare for the party until it's the middle of the party and I'm handing around drinks and food and chatting to my sister's friends and all I can think of is I hope they've forgotten about the speech idea. <laughs> but then I hear the telltale tinkle, 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 tinkle. My mum has the glass. She stands up and says, welcome everyone for coming. She's so proud of her baby daughter. She's asked her big sister Katie to say a few words. I step up and I say, thank you all for coming. It's so wonderful to see you all. Amanda's a wonderful sister. She's a really terrific, wonderful woman. She's a fantastic person. She's a really, really, really... And it's like the words on the Star Wars movies that come up at the start except that I know pretty quickly there's no more words other than really, really great person, thanks. And there's an awkward silence, and my sister says a few words, and there's a bit of polite pause, and everyone gets back to the party. And I stand there, kind of holding it together, until my aunt, my mum's younger sister with the flaming red hair and the long flowing robes makes a beeline for me across the room and she says, what was that? What were you thinking? And I just shattered into a million pieces. And I flee the room and I throw myself on that <coughs> spare bed and I cry my heart out. And after a while, I pull myself together and I go back to the party and life moves on. And in the 30 years since that party, I have not once been asked to speak at a family function. <laughs> and even though those events drove my storytelling heart deep underground, I know now that it was in that moment that my determination to learn to tell stories was born. Human beings are meaning making machines. We are constantly making sense of our experiences and the world around us. Sometimes we assign meaning in an instant, like shame. Sometimes it's more complex and we need to process events and find the meaning that best fits our belief systems. And once we've assigned a meaning, we cast the dime, we tuck our memories to bed, and sometimes that's where they stay for the rest of our lives. But any historian will tell you that meaning making is a dynamic and unfolding process. History study involves two activities, deciding what happened and making sense of what happened. And both of them, but particularly the making sense part, is always changing. We're constantly revising history. As the Australian historian Anna Clark says, and I quote, every generation has written the history of Australia quite differently. Without historical revision, we would still be perpetuating the horrendous myth of Terra Nullius, that this land was uninhabited, when the English first arrived. 
Without historical revision, we wouldn't be celebrating the great contribution of women who had been written out of the history records simply because they were women. It is right and proper that we look at history through the eyes and mind of the present. That's how history serves us. It enables us to look at the past in order to improve the present and anticipate the future. We have whole departments, degrees, libraries, museums dedicated to various forms of history, but we don't have a simple, regular way of understanding our own histories. It seems we've reserved that practice for memoirists or people in long-term therapy. But both of those, apart from being fairly monumental undertakings, miss the reciprocal communal aspect that is oral storytelling. Storytelling enables us to do many, many things. When I first started to choose to tell that story about my sister's 21st birthday, it was simply because there was a, a storytelling night where the topic was celebration and I thought, there's a climactic moment, I'll just tell that and it might, people might relate to it. But as I started to prepare, I had to ask myself, are you ready to tell this story? I had to set it aside and do some self-soothing, some self-forgiveness in order to tell the story not shrouded in shame. But telling that story enabled me to see how shame was blocking me from my own understanding of the gift that was in that failure. Telling that story enabled me to understand my drive to and fear of expressing myself, and it reminded me of my original intention to speak well as something that's a core part of who I am. I've told many stories since then, and each time it's like welcoming home a part of myself that I had long forgotten was me. It's like settling onto my bones in a new and more satisfying way. Storytelling enables us to stand before others and say, this is what I remember happened, and I was feeling and thinking this. And now looking back, I can see how I was shaped, how this taught me, and this is who I am today. This kind of storytelling, the kind with the five qualities, it's oral, told live with no notes, it's true and personal, it holds meaning, it's told in performance time, it's told as a gift. This kind of storytelling, it's a bit like dream work. And like dream work, it will lead us, if we let it, to what we need to understand about ourselves. This type of Storytelling enables us to deepen into ourselves at the same time expanding out when we share. So if you want to understand yourselves better and give your lives more meaning, then craft and tell your stories. And be open to the gifts and surprises along the way. Tell the stories that are knocking inside you to be told, not the ones you think you ought to tell and embrace the messiness of the creative process. But most of all, just have a crack. By all means, think, plan, practice and prepare, but sometimes the best place to start is simply to tell. And if that means starting a storytelling event in your community, your home, your school or your workplace, then do that too. And remember that telling your stories well will also reap you the benefits of its impact on the audience, where they will be engaged, connected, persuaded, and understand you better. Storytelling enables us to reclaim and restore our history in order that we may better know who we are in the present and the future. What will you say if you're asked, why weren't you more like you?